I'm Avery Lovins, Chief Scientist of Rocky Mountain Institute, and talking to you about disruptive oil futures. Energy is America's third largest industry. Let me tell you how, in a single century, America's fifth largest industry, whaling, grew to world dominance and suddenly disappeared. In the mid-19th century, lamps burning whale oil lit most homes. Strong demand and global hunting made whales shy and scarce. The cost of whale oil rose as fleets got bigger but less productive, so the prices got volatile and shot past the price of coal oil. Lamp conversion kits emerged. Michael Dietz's clean burning model paid back in months and flipped the market in three years. So in the nine years before Drake struck oil in Pennsylvania, rock oil, petroleum, whale oil lost over five-sixths of its lighting market. The whalers were astounded to run out of customers before they ran out of whales. The remnant whale populations were saved by technological innovators and profit-maximizing capitalists at least until those same forces of industrialization killed even more whales in the 20th century. So whale oil lost to coal and town gas, which in turn lost to Rockefeller's uh, rock oil kerosene, which two dec decades later lost to Thomas Edison's 20-fold more efficient electric lights and grids and power plants. Better lamps and new types then followed, but then, like a thunderbolt, came white light-emitting diodes. Each, each decade, those LEDs got 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. So McKinsey forecasts they will cut costs and grow revenues 30% per year, <clears throat> taking 64% of the world's general lighting market just by 2020. They're rocking the $200 billion a year lighting services market. And since lighting uses a seventh of the world's electricity, LEDs are also disrupting the business model of electric utilities. Because, you see, they have the wrong model. Thomas Edison didn't sell electricity. He sold lighting. He would charge you a penny to, write, to, to, to run a uh, lamp for an hour. But as electric motors became popular, New York Edison Company wanted to stop selling lighting services and start selling kilowatt hours. Edison probably didn't foresee that his lamps would ultimately get so antique they would be outlawed, but he did know that lamps would become much more efficient. So to capture that benefit himself, he wanted to keep selling lighting services, which would get cheaper as the lamps got more efficient, not kilowatt hours. He was overruled in 1892, and utilities have been making the same mistake ever since, uh, choosing a business model ensuring that greater customer efficiency would cut their revenues, not their costs. The oil and gas industries, too, grew up selling molecules, not the energy services customers wanted from those molecules like mobility, hot showers, and cold beer. Uh, that risky model is now catching up with us as efficiency accelerates from old lamps sedate pace to the blinding speed of LEDs. Yet most fossil fuel firms pay as little attention to competition from radical energy efficiency as whalers paid to Michael Dietz. You know something else that gets very cheap and grows very fast? LEDs run backwards are called photovoltaics and this meteorite strike is what the plummeting price of PVs is doing to fossil fueled electricity even just on the short run margin, counting only their fuel cost. PVs are now less uh, capital intensive than Arctic oil, not counting the ability to use electrons more effectively than molecules. Efficiency is even bigger and cheaper. My shell paper, Efficiency, the Rest of the Iceberg, explains how you can run your supply side tanker into the hidden efficiency iceberg and sink without even knowing what you hit if it wasn't on your chart because you weren't tracking it. What oil and gas markets are in danger from disruptions? Very nearly all of them. Over decades, reserves unburnable for climate reasons could well prove smaller than reserves unsellable for competitive reasons. That is, oil companies may be even more at risk for market competition 
than from climate regulation. If the oil business sputters at $90 a barrel and stalls at 50 how will it do against the $25 cost of getting U.S. mobility completely off oil? What if the biggest challenge to oil companies weren't falling price, but vanishing demand? That's not just hypothetical. In 1975, U.S. government and industry all in insisted that the energy needed to make a dollar of real GDP could never go down. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop threefold in 50 years. So far, it's actually dropped by more than twofold in the first 38 years. Yet, today's far more powerful technologies and design methods, enlightened regulation, maturing financing, marketing, and delivery channels can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at only a third the real cost. And four years later, even that looks conservative. So, are an oil company's competitors other hydrocarbon companies? Or are they perhaps people like these whose innovations can be to the oil business as Michael Dietz's lantern was to whalers? Some of their innovations are technologies, but most are more disruptive than that. Their new business and financial models and breakthrough design methods all stirred vigorously with IT. These new vectors of transformation all reinforce and speed each other. They don't add, they multiply or exponentiate in a fertile mix with crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, innovative public policies, new development patterns, shifting tastes and values in Silicon Valley culture. Seven billion largely linked minds can scale global change nonlinearly, especially when technology becomes vernacular. Six billion people now have cell phones. That's a third more than have access to the 3,000-year-old technology of toilets because toilets take slow public investment in infrastructure, but anyone can go get a phone, and often it's free. So let's start with technology in automobiles, the biggest oil user. Weight causes two-thirds of a typical car's fuel use, and removing weight leverage, leverages seven times larger savings at the tank because you don't need to waste six units of energy getting that one unit to the wheels. Fifteen years ago, we designed a halved weight carbon fiber hybrid SUV boosting efficiency by four to six fold with a two-year payback. In 2007, Toyota showed such a car with the interior volume of a Prius, but half the fuel use and a third the weight. It weighs just 420 kilograms. Now one and two liter equivalent per 100 kilometer carbon fiber electric cars are on the market from Volkswagen and BMW, which confirm that the carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. <coughs> an even faster and cheaper manufacturing technology from an RMI spinoff used to make this carbon fiber carbon cap <coughs> You can tell from the sound, it's extremely strong and stiff. This process can now make two by two meter complex parts in one or two minutes, and it's in the global supply chain. Making all U.S. autos this way would save 15 million barrels a day, that's half an OPEC or one and a half Saudis, by a drilling in a very prospective play called the Detroit Formation. The cost of finding and lifting those nega barrels, $18 per say barrel and following, uh, buys the electrification. The ultralighting is approximately free, paid for by a two-thirds smaller powertrain and by radically simpler automaking with 80% less capital investment. Ultralight electric vehicles can spread and their prices can drop even faster with a temporary policy called a fee-bait. Uh, rebates for efficient new autos paid for by fees on inefficient ones. The biggest of six, six uh, fee-bait programs in France tripled the speed of improving auto efficiency in its first two years, and the strongest fee-bait in Norway raised electrified vehicles market share to 12.5% in 2014. That's about 10 times the U.S. level. For electric vehicles. The same physics and the same business logic also apply to big vehicles. Uh, Walmart's heavy truck fleet 
is using half the fuel to move a case uh, that it used a decade ago. That includes smarter logistics, but just current technology alone can profitably triple the efficiency of heavy trucks. And that plus the triple to quintuple efficiency airplanes designed at places like Boeing and NASA and MIT can transfer $0.9 trillion net present value from oil companies' top line to Americans' pockets. In both heavy and light vehicles, today's military revolution in energy efficiency will speed these advances in the civilian sector, which uses over 50 times as much oil, much as military R&D in the past has given us the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine industry, the microchip industry, only this time speeding the journey beyond oil so nobody need fight over oil and our warfighters can have nega missions in the Persian Gulf and the South China Sea. Mission unnecessary. They really like that idea. Autos are not just heading for one or two liters per hundred kilometers, 125 to 240 miles a gallon. They're also being driven less, starting in Europe and in America, where gasoline use has been falling since 2007. Generations X and Y tend not to want to own a car because it's cheaper and easier not to. A young Londoner or Shanghainese on an evening out can combine many different modes because now smartphones bridge the once awkward route gaps by summoning ubiquitous transport services on demand. One San Franciscan lady reported she was saving $11,000 a year by replacing her car with Uber, Lyft, public transit, walking, biking, and Get Around, which is a smartphone app for renting a neighbor's car when it's unneeded and parked, as U.S. cars are about 96% of the time. Seamlessly linking access options with needs makes you confident you won't need a car, but when you do, you needn't own it. In China, renting a Condi electric vehicle from this giant vending machine costs about $3 an hour. Also, renting shared cars when you need them can boost their utilization about tenfold, and then probably redouble it with partly or fully autonomous vehicles like this Mercedes-Benz concept car. Google plans to release self-driving cars in the next three years. The biggest U.S. company, Apple, is developing them too. They're already legal in four states, and they are the theme of the uh, 2016 Dutch European Union presidency. Autonomy makes electric vehicles' total cost per kilometer 40% lower than that of fueled vehicles because their tenfold lower energy cost per kilometer more than offsets their higher capital cost. So the mashup of mobility with information technology means radically fewer vehicles, all electric, uh, and driving fewer kilometers. So that disrupts both oil companies and electric uh, companies. And... Uh, the shared electric vehicles under an Edison-like service model could drive a million kilometers because carbon fiber doesn't dent, rust, or fatigue. So autos are morphing from pigs, personal internal combustion, gasoline, steel-dominated vehicles, to SEALs, shareable, electrified, autonomous, lightweight service vehicles. Their business and marketing case is strong, and they will further speed the day when cars use no oil. Yet another game changer that can design out most automobility in global growth markets is urban design. Nearly half the world's new cars were sold in China in 2010, when only 5% of people owned cars, yet this 100-kilometer traffic jam took 12 days to unsnarl. Building roads causes traffic, so politicians are changing the rules. In Tokyo, you can't buy a car without owning a place to park it. Denmark taxes new cars 180%, plus 95% duty if they weigh over two tons, plus an annual tax on inefficiency. A license plate in Shanghai costs more than the small car you put it on. Smoggy Beijing registers electric cars instantly for free, but if you want a new fueled car, you have about a 1% chance in the lottery to be allowed to buy a registration. Cars are being phased out in central Copenhagen and by 2050 in, uh, sorry, 2025 in, in Helsinki. Singapore and Oslo inspire London's 25 pound a day fee to drive your car downtown, shifting peak period commuting 
to 85% public transit uh, and cutting congestion 30%. Some Chinese cities that discouraged bikes are now building safe bike lanes. 50 Chinese cities do bike sharing, and China has over 200 million electric vehicles with two wheels, uh, many of them replacing motorcycles and perhaps a fifth replacing cars. China's 3,000 kilometers of bus rapid transit may quintuple in the next five years. This low-tech, high-design, retrofitable innovation transformed the Hangzhou Street on the left into the street on the right, carrying 800,000 riders every day. Over 30 million commuters use bus rapid transit, BRT, each day in nearly 200 cities worldwide. It can achieve subway route density at about 5% the cost. In Curitiba, Brazil, despite having the second highest car ownership in the country, the architect Mayor Jaime Lerner, who invented BRT as a cheaper, faster, better alternative to cars, achieved Brazil's lowest car drivership and cleanest urban air. Now BRT and other non-car modes are reshaping the America's worth of new cities that China plans to build over the next 15 years. Architect Peter Calthorp is helping design uh, Chang'ong around one and a half million pairs of feet, not around cars, so driving will fall by two thirds. Integrating and distributing where people live, work, shop, and play means people needn't travel far nor by car. Each 13 lane super boulevard is replaced by a pair of one way lane, one way streets, easy to cross, and then between those pairs, a car-free BRT street, and between those, pedestrian and bicycle streets. So this shift from a superblock arterial network for vehicles to a capillary web builds a human ecology with vibrant commerce, rich social interaction, one-third less concrete, but equal or better throughput, cleaner air, and happier citizens. The 53 cities already adopting this design will use little oil. Even in the car-dominated U.S., such new urban and smart growth, plus mobility IT integration, and charging real-time driving costs per kilometer, not per liter, can provide the same or better access with 46 to 84 percent less driving uh, at lower cost and with higher profits to the developers. So even in the U.S., where cities are already built around cars, and without the pigs to seals transition or the other latest innovations, we can get greatly enhanced mobility while phasing out oil. We can first get efficient uh, by technologies included or overlooked in the official forecast and use vehicles more productively and then switch fuels. Super efficient autos can use any mixture of hydrogen fuel cells, electricity, and advanced biofuels. The heavy trucks and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen. Trucks can even burn natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. Any biofuels needed at most 3 million barrels a day could be made two-thirds from waste and all of it without displacing cropland and without harming soil or climate. Even five years ago, some mainstream analysts began to see peak oil not in supply but in demand because like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. But efficiency doesn't save only oil. It also changes the game in electricity. Remember how lightweighting autos shrinks their propulsion system, helping to enable and pay for an advanced electric one? Well, such integrative design can do the same thing in buildings and factories radically reducing electric and gas demand so renewables can more readily serve the rest. Let's look how, uh, starting with buildings which use three quarters of U.S. electricity and a third of the directly used natural gas. You might think I would burn a lot of gas to stay warm at 2,200 meters, 7,100 feet up in the Colorado Rockies where it used to go down to minus 44 Celsius, minus 47 Fahrenheit. But my house does no combustion and has no heating system. 
super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and super windows that insulate like 16 sheets of glass that look like two and cost less than three make it 99% passive solar heated. Eliminating the heating system paid up front for the efficiency that displaced it and saved about 90% of household electricity too. The central atrium seen here in a February snowstorm has produced 58 passive solar banana crops. Uh, without needing to look like this, my help, house uh, helped to inspire over 30,000 European passive buildings that have no heating and roughly normal construction cost. By 2020, all new European buildings must use nearly zero energy. And this works from Old Snowmass, Colorado to Bangkok. But wherever you live, integrative design gives multiple benefits from single expenditures. So the white arch holding up the middle of my house, uh, as you can see in the top of the upper middle photograph, has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. New technologies in integrative design keep improving faster than they're installed, making the efficiency resource ever bigger and cheaper. Our 2010 retrofit of the Empire State Building first remade the windows into super windows so they would pass light but block heat, and that shrank the chillers, saving $17 million of capital cost, and that more than paid for the super windows, cutting the total payback to three years. The 38% energy saving there seemed pretty good until our cost-effective retrofit three years later saved 70%, making this half-century-old federal complex more efficient than the best new U.S. office, which in turn is only half as efficient as RMI's new office now being built four years later with no central heating or cooling equipment. Even in sweltering India and Bangalore, our partners likewise save 80% of the energy at 10 or 20% lower construction cost, and the building's photovoltaics make the rest. What about industry, the other big user of fuel and power? Well, it owns most of the motors that use three-fifths of the world's electricity. Half that motor power runs pumps and fans, yet integrative design makes a typical industrial pumping loop use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by getting better pumps and motors and controls, but just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. This also shrank the pumping equipment and the total capital cost. So this isn't even a new technology, it's just rearranging our metal furniture as designers. In my own house, it saved about 97% of the pumping energy, and every unit of friction or flow saved in the pipes saves about 10 units of fuel cost and pollution and carbon back at the power plant. In over $40 billion worth of diverse industrial redesigns for leading global firms, uh, my team has typically found savings around 40 to 90 plus percent with generally lower capital cost or in retrofit about 30 to 60 percent with two or three year paybacks. Such integrative design often makes very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. This well-proven disruption isn't yet in any official study or industry forecast. Beware the iceberg. Here are some more. Our business book, Natural Capitalism, found about 99.98% of the mass flow in the U.S. economy is wasted so doing more work with less stuff is another vast frontier for saving industrial energy through solutions economy business models, biobibicry, additive manufacturing, and other emerging revolutions. As buildings and industry get efficient faster than they grow, electricity demand has fallen in the United States since 2007, as in Europe and Japan. And this helps renewables to displace coal and gas-fired electricity. The plummeting real costs of photovoltaic modules in blue and wind farms in green uh, look pretty sedate on this logarithmic scale, but if we plotted them on the kind of linear scale I was using earlier, they would be very steep and exponential. So today in 20 of the United States, firms now install rooftop photovoltaics with no down payment, soon cash back, and beat your electric bill. Deutsche Bank says that'll be profitable in about 80% of the world by 2017. 
bypassing power companies the way cell phones bypass wireline phone companies gives electricity executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Batteries too are getting rapidly cheaper with technology driven by consumer electronics and volume by electric cars, so more customers are becoming able to drop off the grid altogether, giving old utility business models no place to hide. That's why Barclays downgraded the whole U.S. utility sector, which now pays uh, two or 300 basis points more for capital than solar installers do. The competition isn't just in capital cost and risk, but also in revenue model. Renewables have no operating cost, so the utility gets no extra revenue when you flip the switch. Moreover, your new oil well makes my next one cost more, but your new solar panel makes my next one cost less. Can hydrocarbons win that game? Bloomberg thinks not and projects that over the next 15 years, fossil fueled and nuclear growth will have, not counting their bigger retirements, while renewable growth triples. Here's the market evidence. In each of the past four years, modern renewables, not counting big hydro, added over 80 billion watts a year, more than the net additions of fossil plus nuclear plants, and they got over a quarter trillion dollars a year of private investment. That's more than the world coal industry's market cap. That's a virtu virtuous spiral, too, because the cheaper renewables get, the more we build. So the cheaper they get, so the more we build. China builds the most. It has produced more wind power than nuclear power each of the past three years. And in 2013 alone, China installed more solar capacity than the United States has installed since inventing it 60 years ago. Now, modern renewables also scale up in a fundamentally different way. Traditionally, we built giant cathedral-like power plants, taking years to design and license and build, and each costing billions of dollars. But now, each year, with about the same capital, you can build a photovoltaic plant that each year thereafter produces enough solar modules to produce each year thereafter about as much electricity as your cathedral would produce once you built it. And of course, learning is quick, so each solar factory gets better than the last. So this is why solar output worldwide is scaling up faster than cell phones. Some say renewables are too variable to serve much of our electricity consumption without a breakthrough in cheap bulk storage. Yet in 2014, more than a fourth of Germany's electricity consumption was renewable, and about half in four other European countries with modest or no hydropower. None of them added bulk storage. All of them sustained high reliability for Denmark and Germany, about 10 times better than America's. So the operators have learned how to run these grids as a conductor leads a symphony orchestra. Uh, no instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously produces beautiful music. Later, as grids also integrate electric vehicles for distributed storage, electricity can become largely or wholly renewable using today's technology at normal cost and with resilient grid architecture that makes major blackouts impossible. Gas is no longer a safe haven for oil companies. As efficiency and renewables place gas, displace gas for heat and cogeneration also displaces gas for generating electricity. Uh, and efficiency renewables do the same thing. So together, these three new competitors got over $600 billion of global investment in 2013. They often beat combined cycle gas plants just on operating costs, especially if we count the market value of gas's price volatility, about 2 or $3 a gigajoule, for fair comparison with constant price efficiency and renewables. As you can see, the, the real gas prices in the United States in green bore no relation to the official forecast of gas price in blue. That's a warning against buying gas-fired power plants based on a low spot price. Gas prices inherent volatility complicates risk management and deters finance. So the new story about abundant and affordable energy for the long haul is less about fracked gas than about its inexhaustible, benign, carbon-free, stably priced physical hedges, efficiency, and renewables 
that are outpacing and increasingly outcompeting it. To see how all the moving parts can fit together, 60 colleagues and I rigorously synthesized U.S. energy options with much help from industry and forwards by the president of Shell Oil and the then chairman of Exelon, America's uh, biggest nuclear and third biggest coal-fired utility, for a cost $5 trillion less in net present value than business as usual, assuming carbon and all other externalities are worth zero. Uh, we showed how the United States could support a 2.6-fold bigger economy in 2050 using no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, a third less natural gas, and emitting 82 to 86 percent less carbon. Efficiency would triple. Renewables would quintuple from 10 to 74 percent of primary energy supply. The adoption rates are historically reasonable. Uh, the uh, adoptions all meet normal sectoral hurdle rates for investment, and the whole transition would require no new inventions and no act of Congress, but if enabled and sped by smart subnational state level policies in mindful markets, it could be led by business for profit. U.S. implementation so far is on this reinventing fire track for savings, and it's ahead of target for renewables. Might this also work in China? Four leading organizations are releasing a thorough analysis prepared for the energy authors of the 13th five-year plan. Our preliminary results, so China could have a seven-fold bigger GDP in 2050 using modestly more primary energy than in 2010, getting more than half from non-fossil sources and all much cheaper than business as usual. So President Xi's uh, uh, peak carbon commitment, although it'll take hard work, could actually be achieved some years earlier. And in fact, China's coal burn already fell in 2014 in absolute terms, even as GDP grew that year by 7.4%. China is already exporting its development model to half the world, to the main growth markets, but that model may change. China is intensely interested in integrative design and may launch also an automotive leapfrog that could transform the global competitive landscape. Our partner, Dr. Lin Jiang at uh, Energy Foundation China, is exploring a China-led initiative to accelerate clean tech deployment for global development based on China's cheap capital, unrivaled scaling prowess, and experience with major international development projects. This could leverage public health, climate protection, and macroeconomics. Just investing, for example, to save electricity, not make more, can cut by about 10,000-fold the capital needs of the most capital-intensive sector, electricity, which gobbles a quarter of global development capital to help fund other development needs. These market disruptions are accelerating. Even before photovoltaics made 5% of German electricity, they had destroyed the business model and half the market cap of Europe's top utilities. So in late 2014, Germany's biggest generation share came from renewables. Fossil fuel generation hit a 35-year low. Wholesale prices fell 46% in the past seven years. So Germany's biggest utility announced a bold plan to split in two. It'll profitably deliver efficiency, renewables, customer-centric services, Shareholders will get the unprofitable legacy business of big thermal power plants. And E.ON isn't alone in betting on transformation. Uh, the second biggest German utility, RWE, has announced a similar set of priorities, though without splitting itself up. Legendary investor Warren Buffett has invested $17 billion in photovoltaics and wind and intends to about double that. Uh, CEO David Crane of the merchant utility NRG is doing the same and expects most of his competitors to fail due to dwindling demand. So let's discuss whether <clears throat> uh, hydrocarbon companies too should ignore, deny, resist, diversify, hedge, finance, transform, or decline. The oil price crash focuses us on the need for price to exceed cost requiring lower cost or higher price or both. 
But don't forget the other part of the fundamental business imperative, that value must exceed price. If competitors offer a superior value proposition, like a car that people prefer because it's better, not just because it's super efficient, or a business model that lets them get the access and mobility they want without a car, then the ability to deliver petroleum products profitably does not mean customers will buy them. All that matters is whether insurgents get to the customers and revenues first. And if they do, the customers may be gone, and so may the oil business. The whaling history actually illustrates this. When, when competition crushed demand for whale oil and sperm oil, the, the green curve, its price, the blue curve, uh, at first soared, perhaps surprising economic theorists, but the subsequent price collapse did not persuade lost customers to return. Coal oil lamps had already beaten whale oil lamps since 1857. People weren't going back. And from the early 1880s, electric lights beat both. So what mattered was not price elasticity of demand for oil to burn and abandon old lamps, but rather customers' irreversible substitution of new ways of getting light. So how fast can that happen? Well, the Model T Ford's nominal price fell 62% in 13 years, 1908 to 1921. And as the Stanford Innovation Lecturer Tony Sieben illustrates, the market flipped just as fast. On New York's Fifth Avenue in 1900, you have to look for the first car. And then just 13 years later, you have to look hard to find the last horse. The horse-driven transport industry thought it had many decades to adapt because you'd have to build roads and filling stations and traffic lights, and it would be very slow. But Henry Ford disagreed, and he won. You see, the pace of transformation is set by not incumbents, but insurgents. They're not inhibited by the incumbent's uh, business model or culture. They're not encumbered by the incumbent's legacy assets, both physical and psychological. The mainframe computer and wireline phone companies, too, had sophisticated models reassuring them that change would be very slow and their products would enjoy robust demand for many decades but the disruptors didn't care. In fact, incumbents have even less time than insurgents grant them because investors flee first before customers do. Capital markets keenly sniff out disruption so they can be first to decapitalize some firms or sectors and shift to others. Investors work on leading indicators, gut hunches, herd behavior, all spreading at the speed of Twitter. So once the capital markets think you're in the toaster or even heading for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they shift to your successors. Again, the whaling history is instructive. Just like today's oil exploration, uh, each whaling voyage by each vessel was structured as a separate venture with participating partners. And as soon as those investors realized demand was dwindling, the capital dried up. Uh, abundant whaling capacity at rock bottom prices could still catch more whales, but why risk being caught with a cargo that you can't sell at a profit or maybe at all? So shrewd investors reallocated their assets. They would instantly recognize the stage of our modern rock oil industry, petroleum, with its mature provinces in decline and fiercely contested, its prices volatile, its ingenuity strained, its exploration pushed to the ends of the earth, literally at spiraling cost and risk, and unforeseen competitors inexorably taking away its demand. Investors still bear scars from the failure of big old strong companies that didn't survive the IT transition, but they got rewarded by those that did. Many investors now sense that the energy industries are starting to be transformed beyond recognition, so they're getting skittish. These changes are happening well within current planning horizons and faster than many firms' cultures can tolerate, creating a formidable leadership challenge as Jack Welch said, if the rate of change on the outside is greater than the range of rate of change on the inside, the end is near. Which of the great companies on the left will be brave enough, I wonder, to make that perilous crossing and join the firms on the right? Which category will you choose? So let me end as I began with the 160-year-old story about how the whalers went broke by overlooking Michael Dietz. The last chapter is now playing out, 
in oil's last lighting market, which, if it were a country, would rank number eight in carbon emissions plus huge health costs. It's the kerosene lamps in the huts and hovels of 1.2 billion people with family income around $2 a day and little prospect of getting or affording grid electricity. They pay $38 billion a year, one-fifth of the total cost of global lighting services, for just one-thousandth of the light, because their lamps are so inefficient. But now, at a six-thousandth the total service cost of a standard flashlight, they can banish darkness, teach their daughters to read, and charge their smartphones. An entrepreneurial village woman can sell or lease them an integrated photovoltaic lithium battery LED lighting package like this Waka Waka Swahili for Shines Brightly. It's very bright and it has four strengths. This one runs for 150 hours on a charge. It pays back in weeks to months and no longer buying oil earns the owner an annuity equal to a month's extra salary or, or income each year. So there goes the last bit of Rockefeller's 155-year-old kerosene business. To which of these two offerings and strategies would you entrust your company's future? Thank you for your kind attention.